Thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Jolene Olson. If you have any questions about your membership or the factor service, you can reach me on our website up in the right hand corner. There's a contact us button. We are so happy you're here and I would like to welcome Peter. Thank you, Jolene. Thanks for putting this together. Hey, welcome factor members uh, to the webinar today. We're doing uh, something a little different. We have guests on board. I, I put out an invitation on public Twitter to uh, welcome uh, somebody to sit in and, and listen to us today who may not be familiar with the Factor community. So, hey, Factor members, be of your best behavior knowing that we've got guests in the house. And I've allocated about 60 minutes for today's webinar. Now I'm going to break it down into three segments. Uh, you know, first, just for the sake of guests who may not be familiar with, with Factor and what I do, I want to provide a little background to that. Context always, you know, is everything. So no sense in me uh, t talking about markets or charts unless there's a context for that. So I want to give that. And then secondly, I, I want to go through the charts for which I currently hold a position in, in the factor prop account or for, for which I'm looking at this week uh, to, uh, to possibly enter a trade. And then third, hopefully we can you know, breathe through the first couple of things in maybe 15 or 20 minutes and devote 40 minutes to, to whatever questions you might have, but, but nevertheless, welcome. So let me just give uh, a little background I know that if you're here, it's because as a guest, you sat on Twitter and you've seen a lot of what I do on Twitter, but probably don't have a a background of, of how I've even got to the point where, at least in the last 10 years, I've become a Twitterite, but it's the last 10 out of a career of almost 50 years trading the markets. I came from the exchanges. Uh, you know, I started on the trading floor at the Chicago Board of Trade. It's where... I learned the business and, you know, I just can't imagine having become a private Twitter, uh, trader the way I am had I not been lucky enough to really start at an exchange where you're in a building with professional traders, you're riding elevators and eating lunch and commuting on trains in Chicago with, with other people who have gone before you and who have made a career of trading. It's just, it's, it's a great experience. And, uh, you know, I, I wish the exchange life still was around because it, it's, it's, a, it's a rich experience to be on the exchange. Just to talk a little bit about how I got there. I joined the Board of Trade in 1975. I was in my mid-20s. And, you know, I had no savings to speak of when I joined the Board of Trade. I had no family member money to back me up. I had a wife, two sons, uh, you know, but somehow I naively believed that I could become a successful commodity trader. How, how I believe that, I have no idea. I, I worked for the world's second largest grain company, Continental Grain. Uh, they were headquartered in Europe, but I was at the Board of Trade, and they gr agreed to pay me a draw against the grain business that I could bring into the business. So I was on the customer side of of uh, trading for four years, but my goal was to really be a private trader. I wanted to be a proprietary trader, self-funded proprietary trader, and somehow make a living uh, as as a trader. And I tried. Continental would allow you to trade your own account. If you had $30,000, you could trade it. And, um, you know, it's a steep wall. And so I blew out at least three accounts in the early years. I, I, I was forced to learn risk management at the School of Wrecked Accounts. And I tried to trade a variety of ways, fundamentals and cycles and seasonals and spreads and, you know, a number of other ways, um, you know, but I slowly gained traction. And, and that's really especially after I discovered uh, charting in uh, 1978. And through 1979, I really started gaining traction. Charts just resonated with me. 
Um, it, 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 and it's hard to believe, but back then there were very few people who charted. Everybody seems to chart today. There's charts everywhere you look. Where back in the 70s, we had to keep our charts by hand. And uh, but I slowly started making money. And by the, the late 1979s and early 1980s, I was actually uh, becoming a good trader, I think. But, you know, it takes three to five years, in my opinion, really to become accomplished as a, as a market speculator. I had a conversation with Jack Schwager last week. And Jack, of course, is the author of the Market Wizard series and has interviewed more full-time successful traders than anybody else in the world. And we had a, we talked about that, and he mentioned that of the 60 plus uh, traders that he's interviewed for Market Wizard series, you know, all but two or three really had to kind of crawl the steep wall and and blow out accounts and and learn the hard way that there really just were less than a handful of people he felt that he's talked to that really hit it right away within, within a first year or two, uh, we're doing real well. So, you know, um, I started a prop firm in 81 then, and, you know, since I've traded in six different decades and in, in the seventies, eighties, nineties, the double zeros, the tens and now the twenties. And I hope not to trade in the thirties. I'm giving myself maybe a couple more years. Um, and, I, I, and I've got to add that I was lucky enough at the Board of Trade to have some really good mentors and guys that really kind of jammed down my throat what's really needed to be a successful market speculator. And I think the thing that they I learned more than anything else from them is, you know, it's easy to make money in the markets if you just stick around. You know, the, the challenge is keeping it. Uh, I mean, that's the hard part about trading is if you trade and you keep your money intact, uh, you can do it. So anyway, uh, learning to trade is a journey. It's not a destination. I'm a classical chartist. I trade primarily the global futures markets with a little bit of spot FX crypto. And I do trade ETFs, but mainly ETFs that deal with raw materials uh, I don't really trade individual stocks and I don't trade options. I'm a swing trader. You know, I don't attempt to catch bottoms and tops. It's not what I'm into. I want to catch chunks in the middle. Uh, I want to be involved in markets, not in trading ranges, but when they come out of trading ranges. I'm a classical chartist in the sense of Edwards, McGee, and Schaubacher. And Schaubacher, of course, published his book, 1934, Edwards and McGee, 1948. And for me, those are the Bibles. So I'm a classical chartist. But not only that, I really focus on horizontal patterns, right angle triangles, rectangles, head and shoulders patterns. You know, my week begins really on the weekend. On Saturday, I scroll through a couple hundred charts of all the global of futures markets, some of the primary ETFs that I might look at, and some spot forex crosses, and uh, I scroll through weekly and daily charts, and kind of earmark the ones that stand out to me as having the type of patterns that for me are setups, and and so I'll end up after scrolling through those charts with a list of ten to fifteen patterns. And those really then are either markets that I have a position in or markets that I will consider a position in for the, for the following week. And on Sunday, then I enter orders. I trade based on resting stop orders. And in most cases, they're open orders. And so there may be some weeks in which something will hit my radar screen that wasn't on there the weekend before. But for the most part, my trading during the week is limited to markets I've identified on Saturday and Sunday prior to the week. I uh, average about two new initial positions a week. I refer to them as NIPs. Um, the maximum risk that I have on a trade is 80 basis points. That's eight tenths of 1%, less than 1% of the total nominal capital is my risk per trade. I break trades into tranches, usually 
two tranches, sometimes three. And each tranche will be uh, traded just a little bit different. Uh, one of the tranches will be very actively and aggressively traded. I, I move stops quickly. And one of the tranches will be, uh, I'll attempt to give it a little bit of room. I tried to have a break-even trade within days. And I'm not very patient with losses. Uh, those of you who are factor members know that once I have red ink on a trade, it has a pretty short lifespan. And I trade to targets. I take profits at targets when I'm offered it. Whole times, for me, if I have a losing trade, uh, it's usually gone uh, 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 within days. And I automatically will exit trades that are losers on a Friday. And I will most often not look to re-enter those trades. They then are removed from my radar screen. Uh, winners, I generally hang on to for days to weeks. Remember that uh, futures markets automatically are subject to 60-40 tax treatment. So I'm not like stock market traders looking to hold on to positions. I'm just swing trading the moves. My trading philosophy really is a matter of throwing mud against the wall, seeing what sticks, take losses quickly, then hope and pray that a few trades blast off. 15% um, of my tranches usually produce 80% of my net profits from year to year. And so uh, let me just then now turn and go through kind of the charts that are on my radar screen that I earmarked over the weekend that I looked at over the weekend as either charts for which I have a position or markets that I'm looking at for potential position. I, I'm going to show this on the PDF, but then I'm going to go over to my charting platform. But this is Bitcoin. I have a position on in Bitcoin. But generally speaking, my biggest positions in terms of cash outlay tend to be in Bitcoin. I'm not, I don't, I trade Ether from time to time. I trade spot Bitcoin, uh, not futures, although I will from time to time uh, make my bet in the futures market, but generally speaking, uh, in spot. But I'm a long term bull on Bitcoin. I'll just point that out as a general comment and then move on to the individual markets for which I have positions or looking to have positions. <clears throat> this is Ether. I'm not a big enthusiast on Ether, quite frankly. For me, Bitcoin is crypto. Crypto is Bitcoin. I don't get Ether. I have dealt with Ether uh, and find that it's it, it's not it's not to me a store of value, and quite frankly, it's not very. It doesn't have good functionality. I think it's in a big wedge here, which could become a bear wedge. And so, if I end up expressing a short position in crypto, it will be via ether, via futures, by via a breakdown of this rising wedge. Okay, I am going to now turn to um, my chart screen. This is Bitcoin. I have a 50% long position in, in Bitcoin, spot Bitcoin at this point. It was based on the breakout of this rectangle pattern. If you can kind of follow my scroll, uh, I've taken, I was 100% position. I took profits at a target. I remain long a 50%. By the way, it, I had a fake out in Bitcoin here uh, over the weekend. I'll point that out as I felt that uh, Bitcoin was forming this, this bullish pennant on the daily chart. And when it broke through the 38,000 level, I added a 50% position uh, uh, as a pyramid which I turned around and blew right back out. It didn't have a good close on the 24th, uh, which was Friday. I, I put it on late in the day, it, and then Saturday it didn't follow through, and I blew it out. Again, I have no patience when it comes to, uh, to losing trades. Uh, just let me go through the markets I'm really looking at. Uh, this is in the Kai Dow. 
I trade this in Osaka, not at the CME. But this is a really, I'm very bullish Japanese stocks and have been. And so, uh, and I'll talk about the Topex in a few minutes. It's it's market, which I do have a position. But if you take a look at the Nikkei Dow, we're finally working our way back to a high that we made way back in the 1980s. And it's taken that long for uh, the Nikkei Dow to finally get back to the high that it made way back in 1989 is we're working our way back. I do not have a position in the Nikkei Dow. Uh, just a look at at this big right angle broadening triangle that we that we completed in 1920. And I think when you look at uh, at 2020, I'm sorry, not that quite old. I'm an, I'm an ancient dinosaur, but I didn't trade in the 1920s. But you take a look and we have kind of a fractal going on right now. This is the daily chart of the Nikkei Dow. I trade thrust breakouts. I do not trade markets within trading ranges. I set an ATR breakout. The ATR that I use is an average 30-day ATR uh, I will take a, a percentage of that ATR depending on the duration of the pattern. In this case, it's quite a long pattern, so it'll be 100% of the 30-day ATR is where my open stops are. I do not tell members where my stops are because I don't want them front running my own orders. Uh, but I do, I am precise in terms of this is going to be a 100% ATR breakout trade for me. Uh, so that's a tie down. Apple is a, a position that I have on. I was long 100% pos long position in Apple based on the breakout of a falling wedge. I normally don't trade wedges because my my preference is diagonal is horizontal patterns, not diagonal patterns. But in this case, it was such a well defined. Uh, wedge that actually could have extended all the way back to the all-time highs. I'm going to reset something here. I, when I look at crypto, I trade crypto and look at crypto on the semi-log basis. All other markets uh, linear. Uh, I took a half a profit against this high, against the September high. I remain long a 50% position in Apple, and my target is the old high, at which point I will exit and be flat. Uh, this is Broadcom. I am long 100% position in Broadcom. For me, this is the favorite pattern I have which is a rectangle between eight weeks and 26 weeks. Uh, that for me is a sweet spot, especially if the range of the rectangle is somewhere less than 15% of the nominal value. I have, I have probably made more money proportionally based on narrow rectangles than any other classical chart pattern. Uh, I'm long 100% position. What I do when I target, and I'll, I'll do this again, is I I just I just kind of ballpark targets. I take this drawing tool, I find the width of it, uh, I I and then I just kind of take an arrow and I ballpark it. And so when I'm in a position, once I enter a position, I immediately have a protective stop. And then I place a target uh, order which rests in the market. I try to, to trade everything I trade based on resting orders. Now, obviously, stop orders become market orders. But what I don't want to do is be making decisions during the trading range. I avoid that. Uh, this is a chart of uh, just an ETF based metals, but for me, this is setting up as really quite a bearish thing. Now, somebody might say, well, if you're bearish, uh, the base metal ETF, that must mean we're going into a recession. I don't think that way. I trade each chart on its own merit, and I don't believe in creating macro, glo global macro scenarios based on charts. For me, this is a potentially bearish chart if it breaks out of the bottom. But if we break through 1924 with the appropriate ETF, uh, 
average true range day, I will consider this entire pattern as a fulcrum bottom, a complex fulcrum bottom, which is a very bullish pattern. So this is the type of thing that I could go either way on depending on the breakout. I am long the Australian dollar. I bought the Australian dollar based on the completion of a head and shoulders. The, the March contract doesn't quite trace out the head and shoulders as well as the continuation chart or the December chart. But nevertheless, I went long the breakout of the head and shoulders bottom in Australian dollar. I'm long 100% position. I am long GLD in the gold. I want to be long futures. I just think that we've got a massive bull market coming in gold that we have formed a, it's not a perfect cup and handle because technically the handle should be below the high prior to the cup. So this is a little bit of an elevated handle. It diminishes the validity of the cup and handle a little bit, but nevertheless, I'm looking here at gold, especially when you look at gold on, on a weekly chart, I think what we have is a left shoulder, a right shoulder, and we could come back down all the way really to the 1700 before we form another right shoulder to go up. However, nevertheless, I'm long GLD and will buy the futures if we break out of this pattern. Here's the chart of GLD, which again shows you this possible continuation inverted head and shoulders. Everybody tells me there isn't such a pattern, Peter. Well, take that up with Schaubacher and Edwards and McGee because in both of their manuscripts, they discuss the concept of, of inverted continuation head and shoulders patterns. It's a legitimate pattern. Uh, this is the Topex, Japanese Topex, which kind of their version of the S&P. I am 100% long this. Let me just show you what I see here on a longer term basis. But uh, to me, this is an extremely bullish market. Now, I don't trade quarterly charts, but I do look at longer term charts in terms of giving me bias directionally. And so uh, I'm long 100% position in the Topex. I bought the Topex based on what I believe to be a, a completed failure that we had a left shoulder head, right shoulder, and we broke out through the right shoulder high. It was a buy signal for me. Uh, I want to show you a chart. This is London coffee. And when I trade the softs, I prefer London, is we have this megaphone going on here. Now, uh, let me just show you the really long term chart of London coffee. And we are in this big trading range that goes back uh, almost 20 years. But I think that, you know, there's been some real crop growing problems in portions of the, of the world on the softs. I'll show you what's happened to cocoa is we also had this big, broad trading range and have had in this massive ripping bull market in London cocoa. And I'm not giving up on the chance that maybe we see the same thing in London coffee. NASDAQ for me is an extremely bullish potential chart that here we have a cup and a handle in the NASDAQ. I know all of the bearish news. Everybody's going to tell me the bearish news. But nevertheless, I don't trade the news. I trade the charts. And for me, this is potentially an extremely bullish chart. We have not had an ATR breakout of the, the handle, but it's something I'm looking at. Uh, silver, hardest market, most frustrating market in the world for me is silver. Uh, I can't. I, I got to tell you, I've made a lot of money trading silver over the years, but it's also a market that's given me more fits than anything else. But you know, I'm bullish gold. I'm bullish silver. I am a hundred percent long URA, the uranium ETF. This for me is an extremely bullish long-term chart. But I am long in this market and think the major trend is up. One final chart, and that's T-notes. 
uh, that's been probably my most profitable market that in grains and I guess softs in the last couple of years. But of course, we've had this big increase in rates, decrease in the price. Uh, I thought that T notes for me could be setting up for a short trade. I haven't done anything yet, but I'm looking here at the notes that we had a left shoulder ahead, a right shoulder that the market's trying to break out. We haven't uh, in engulfing today, today, but I don't want to make too much out of a one day thing. But I, I've kind of had it in the back of my mind is that we're not done going down in the price of yield. So anyway, that wraps up uh, Jolene, my coverage of charts. These represent the charts for markets that I am in or am considering in. But that's a decision that I make as a trader, mostly on a Saturday and Sunday. I avoid trying to make decisions during the week other than where I'm going to move stops to be more aggressive. So, Jolene, I'll let you go from here and I'll try to answer some questions in the time that's left. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Peter. I'm sending the first question through right now. I have a longstanding stance that Bitcoin has a 50% chance of continuing to increase in value and a 50% chance of going to zero. Um, and that's because right now, I think Bitcoin is kind of almost the ultimate store of value. But on the other hand, is Bitcoin the highest achievement man can make in terms of store of values? I doubt it. And so for me to think that uh, there is not something that can be better than Bitcoin, I don't think gives the the... the the, the benefit of the doubt to human intelligence and capability to improve things. So a uh, 50% chance of going to whatever, half a million, 50% chance of going to zero. Uh, in what instance would I see Bitcoin going to zero? And if that were the case, how fast would such an event happen? I, I don't know. I, it's a hard question to ask other than governments hate Bitcoin. Uh, to what degree can government intervention? I know that we're, we're going to get into the whole ETF of Bitcoin discussion. I, I just think for me right now, Bitcoin is the ultimate store of value because fiat's not is the ultimate store of destruction. And uh, and so, but on the other hand, government intervention and new technology and the advancement of, of human achievement, for me to, to say nothing will ever be better than Bitcoin, I, I'm not willing to make that that, that, that case. So I, I don't know. There's a lot of unknowns. Uh, which four pillars is most crucial? Okay, for, for gas, I, I kind of have four pillars that for me, the big pillars of trading. Trade selection is one. Risk and trade management is one. Emote, management of emotions, controlling emotions, because the human being who is a discretionary trading, their, their emotions will do anything to sabotage trading. So, And that's a pillar. And the final pillar is just the process of trading. Treating trading as a business, how those are legitimate business, and how do you how do you create excellence in all aspects of trading? The most critical to me is risk management because if you lose your capital, you're out of the game, and none of the other components even matter. And so it's controlling risk. It it, it comes back to what the old timers taught me at the board of trade in the 1970s, and when I'm talking about old timers, I'm talking about people that came into the pits after World War II. They were soldiers. And, you know, it was their generation. It was a silent generation, which were the veterans at the Board of Trade. And they used to always say, hey, this is not hard. You just got to cut your losses quickly. You got to let your profits run, but you got to cut your losses quickly. And so to me, that's the most critical thing is not letting trades take you out of the game. So the question are, am I still trading weekly charts or will I trade daily patterns? Oh, I'll trade daily patterns. I mean, the chart you see right now is treasury notes. Now, 
for me is this pattern as a potential head and shoulders failure enough of a pattern for me to trade because when you go to it on a weekly basis you really don't see it and so i will consider daily charts but the only reason i consider daily chart here is i'm still not convinced that inflation is whipped and so to a certain degree i'm letting a global macro narrative dictate perhaps taking a trade that I wouldn't purely on the basis of the chart alone. And, and, and so that's a case where I will do it on a daily basis. And, but I prefer really weekly. I mean, we, when I first scroll, the, the charts I flag are weekly charts. Then it's weekly charts to generate a narrative or an opinion. It's daily charts for timing and risk management. Any opinion on the stock, FLR, well, look, Fluor Corp, again, what I want to do is go, when I look at a chart like that, is, uh, is, is take a look. I mean, there's no trade for me. When You know, for me, really, opinion is kind of not a correct way for me to even think about it. I, I, I don't want to think bullish, bearish, although I'll express that. What I want to think is, do I have a setup? Is there a setup for me? And there's not here. I mean, we've had a bounce coming off the 2020 low, which has been a diagonal, uh, a diagonal advance. See the overlap. This this would create havoc for me. Is you high, low, high, you overlap it, high, you overlap it. Uh, this is a market that that is an absolute headache for me. But I look at a market like that, I think, okay, I mean, the best thing you can do is you can say you've got a you've got a channel and maybe you buy at the bottom of the channel, but you got plenty of overhead resistance. We've got massive overhead resistance in this chart. I prefer when I'm looking at a chart, I want to find a chart that's breaking into new, at least new new all-time highs, if not new highs for the last couple of years. So it's really not a pattern here for me uh, to be looking at. I don't see a recognizable pattern. Okay, any idea why did Edwards McGee become more popular than Schaubacher? Uh, I'm not sure, other than Schaubacher published his book, uh, and it... it, it um, he died several years later, unfortunately, in his own hands. Uh, and it was Edwards that was, his, I believe, his son-in-law. I've read the book. I can't remember exactly the relationship. And they took the book and they, they ran with it and expounded. It was greatly expounded for one thing. Uh, I mean, they, they, they went way beyond what Schaubacher did. Although for me, Schaubacher is still the place to go to. Uh, and, and there's a hardcover copy that's now been produced of Schaubacher's uh, Technical Analysis and Stock Market Profits, published 1934. And, and in my opinion, I would not buy the Edwards and McGee book unless it's uh, edition six or older, because there is uh, there is a person who has been publishing recent additions to the Edwards and B.B. book and has quite frankly added way more than I think he has the capability of intelligently added. And so the book to me is now flawed, the Edwards and B.B. book, unless it's uh, edition six or older. Uh, has this been one of the toughest years performance-wise? This is the next question. It it was. I mean, I started off January through June, oh, January really through April, doing really well. I mean, I think I was up twenty percent in the first four months, and and then I spent a month in Europe, didn't trade, came back uh, end of May, and the markets were have just been in fits. I actually had the longest uh, peak to valley to new peak drawdown in the last, well, since 19, since 2013, as a matter of fact, it was the longest peak to valley. It wasn't real deep at, at its deepest. It was probably three and a half percent based on uh, sequential close trade at NAVs, uh, six to seven percent. 
in terms of peak to valley, mark to the market, daily or weekly. But it just was frustrating. I mean, it was just uh, I, I, I'd get a trade. It would slap me. It, it was a very tough period. Now, I've come out of it. Uh, and now I'm, you know, I'm up pushing 30 percent for the year. But, boy, I just yeah, I, I just couldn't gain any traction there for months. So, yeah, performance wise, it's tough. Now, it wasn't as bad a period as I had in 2022, even though 2022 was a wonderful year for me. But 2022 members will remember when I went uh, 19 out of 21 trades that I established were losers. And after that sequence, I think I had two or three winning trades and then immediately like seven or eight consecutive losing trades. So, hey, that comes with the territory. There's good times, there's bad times. You got to protect yourself against the bad times. Okay, question. uh, Am I looking at Forex pairs as closely as futures contract when I'm charting and looking for potential positions? The, the answer is that, yes, I scroll through all of the major majors. Now, major, major, majors are British pound, euro, Swiss franc, Japanese yen, Canadian dollar. Australia. It's, it's, it's your global reserve currencies against global reserve currencies. I look at those. I look at majors versus minors. Now, minors would be Swedish krona, um, it would it, and the like. I do not trade the exotics. I don't or I don't get involved in. I'm going to trade the, the Swedish krona against the Polish zloty or whatever. That for me is no. I prefer to trade futures contracts. Uh, given all considerations, I want to trade majors against the dollars, which means futures. There's reason for that. I know my counterparty risk is better controlled. I know my tax treatment is better controlled, and I don't. And I play, and I pay the hypothetical roll charge rather than the rip-off roll charge. In, uh, imposed upon traders by what I believe to be these crooked Forex dealers. And so I I will trade spot Forex. I do so hesitantly. So I'm going to need to see a really good pattern for me to trade something that's not tradable as a futures contract. Do I trade all coins too? No. Um, are you taking chart requests for all coins? No. I just don't trade altcoins. I I don't like altcoins. I know they have big movements, but you know, and and it comes back. I want a liquid market, and I want to know my counterparty risk. I just I continue to think that ninety nine percent of the coins that that the people trade are going to end up worthless. I have no desire to be trading a coin that eventually is going to be worthless. Uh, and I know I'm probably offending some of you with your pet coins, but I, you know, I, I just feel if I can't make my living trading things like treasury bonds and gold and silver, uh, if I have to resort to making my year with all coins, I'm in trouble. Uh, how do you decide where to set your stop and when to enter a new position? Okay, new position. Okay, here's here's a here's a pattern. I I believe that we have this huge cup in handle in the Nasdaq, and so I look and say, where's the high? The high of the handle. I'm I'm looking at the nearby contract of the Nasdaq with a high of 16.062. Now I don't have uh, the chart here. I'm not going to tell you my my stop in price again because I. I don't like publishing that for two reasons. First, I don't want people front running my orders, uh, and 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 I don't want the, the you know I don't want the algo guys and high frequency traders trading against my orders. But the second reason is I really don't want factor members to try to mirror me, because I believe that to be successful, a trader has to develop their own style, 
And, and, and so it's my hope that it's really the components of trading as a business practice, risk management, and emotion management is the value that I can add the factor members, not trade signaling, because I think I, I really believe that anybody who seriously wants to have either a career or a profitable side gig as a trader needs to figure out their own way to do it. So I look at this, this is a long enough pattern that goes, you know, this this goes back, you know, this is a 10 month, 11 month pattern now for me, which is a full 30 day uh, ATR. And so, um, you know, I, the 30 day ATR, I, I, that's on a different chart thing, which I don't want to bring up, but you add your 30-day ATR, you add it to that level. It's an interday, it's a, it's an open stop. I have an open stop. I Now, I don't trade the big NASDAQ. I trade the micros because it gives me more flexibility, uh, and there's plenty of volume in the micro, but uh, it, it'll be 100% position when we break through. Now, in terms of how do I how do I risk that? Is it a cup and handle is a difficult? Uh, I'm going to go back to um, another market to show I think a little bit more here in terms of how to break out. This this is a pattern that really goes back to June, and so uh, this is a five month pattern. So five months is basically a twenty twenty some. Uh, 22 week pattern, and I know for a 22 week pattern, I I will use 80 percent of the 30 day ATR, and so I set my stop accordingly. It's an open stop. I work it. I you know somebody who says, well, I'm going to wait for a breakout and then I'll trade the market. They're going to miss the breakout. They're going to second guess themselves. And so for me, I find that I've got to have the orders in, and to do that, I use open orders. And I place open orders. And so I have an entry order to buy this if it breaks out. Now, where do I place my stop? That may change from day to day. But I'll tell you where it is for today is I know when I look at today's range, because, again, keep in mind that Japan is way, way in front of us. So they're already working on the price bar for the 28th. But I look, I know the price bar of the 27th and the price bar of the 27th based on cash is 33.397. So I'll go under that level. I use a concept called the last day rule is I'm going to trade prices closely. I don't mind taking losses. Taking losses does not offend me. I just feel taking losses in trades is part of the discovery process of finding the winners. And so I'm not going to hang around a trade when it goes against me. And so I have relatively tight stops. And so for me, I will risk half of the trade against this intermediate low, 33.182, half the trade against the last day rule, 33.397. And I will look if the trade goes with me and I can get two to three days of gain on the trade. I'll look to go to break even as quickly as I possibly can. So that's uh, that's kind of how I trade that. OK, uh, in the FLA chart, do such patterns mean retesting the recent low successfully by making a higher high again and again to break out? OK, I'll go back to FLR. Someone's interested in FLR. Again, there's just no, I, I have no setup in FLR. And I, you know, if I'm trading, let's say the channel in FLR, if I was a channel trader, if I'm looking to buy, uh, buy below the market rather than buy the upthrust, and I say, well, I want to be long FLR, where do I get long FLR? It's in the middle of a, diagonal advance. This is not not a buy for me. A new high doesn't mean anything to me. If I'm looking to try to pre-position it, which I don't, I buy back toward 30 in a quarter. And I probably risk to that low. So again, it's not how I trade, but um, it would be a way to trade this. But in terms of an upside breakout, there's no upside breakout to be had 
because there's no pattern to be had other than this channel. And an upside breakout of this channel would be an extended market again that would be extending into a lot of overhead resistance. Uh, so again, this is just not a trading market for me. It's not a market to trade. Using uh, technical methods, what are good books for day swing trading? Okay, assuming you're a factor member, uh, last week, I believe, I sent out an extensive document to discourage people against day trading. If, if you're so prone to be a day trader, um, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm not a day trader. I've never really been a day trader. I'm sure there are some good books out there. Uh, hey, if any factor members know a good book on day trading, put it out on the private factor tweet stream as a recommendation. Uh, I just, I discourage day trading. Swing trading, the best book is Schaubacher and Edwards and McGee. Uh, I mean, I love, I mean, for me, Schaubacher is the Bible. And so, you know, I'm a swing trader. I swing trade classical chart patterns. Do I follow only Robusta or do I follow uh, Aribica or the, 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 the New York futures? I, I follow New York. I, I just found that for me, um, for me, it's just a choppier market. Uh, New York coffee, New York cocoa, New York sugar have always been uh, dishonest markets, less reliable markets, false breakouts, bad fills, uh, just not good markets. They're, they're what I re refer to as 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 the New York markets from hell. Uh, it's it's you know they're just tough markets. It's the New York Sea markets from hell. Coffee, cocoa copper uh are just tough markets so yeah i chart them i look at them i scroll them but uh even if i see something in a london coffee chart that interests me i kind of go okay i want to take a look at i want to take a take a look at london because that's where i prefer to be because that's where the commercials are it's just like in the case of wheat there's kansas city wheat minneapolis wheat chicago wheat Speculators trade Chicago wheat, commercials trade Kansas City wheat. And so I just find the degree to which the commercials are more active in the market is the degree to which they're more liquid, even though they may not have the same volume, but they have better liquidity. So again, I just I prefer I prefer the London markets. Okay, uh, in order of top three to four preferences, what are my favorite patterns? Number one, uh, in eight to 26 week rectangle clearly defined uh, continuation, although reversal would count, but pre pre preferably continuation like we have in Broadcom. Great pattern. Uh, so I love that. I love these. They're, they're, they're great. That'd be number one. Uh, the second would be ascending triangle or descending triangle, or in other words, a right angle triangle. Uh, let's see if I have one here, not in this group, but it would be, and again, I, it would be somewhere uh, where from high to low, it's 15, 10, 15, 20% of the underlying value. Uh, and, and, and then head and shoulders would be, and again, it's a head and shoulders. If it's a bottom, I want the right shoulder high to be above the left shoulder high. In other words, an up slanting neckline with plenty of overlap of the shoulders in a head and shoulders bottom. A down slanting neckline with plenty of overlap between the shoulders and the head and shoulders top. I do not like head and shoulders tops with up slanting necklines or head and shoulders bottoms with down slanting necklines. Way, way too many false breakouts. They're very tricky. Uh, and so I count the head and shoulders. I, 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 hey, just a couple of points. I don't like trend lines. I, I think, you know, throw a chart book in the, in the cage of an ape with a ruler and a pen, and pretty soon the ape's going to draw in a trend line that makes sense. 
So, you know, I'm not a fan of diagonality, diagonal lines. I like horizontal lines on the chart representing support and resistance. I'm not a big indicator fan. I do look at uh, Bollinger Bands from time to time. I do use moving averages, but not systematically. I use moving averages as a proxy for trend. Although I do use the eight day moving average for risk management on one of my two tranches, on the most active of the tranche. Again, Broadcom's a great example of that where we broke out and we went. We broke out. We had our ATR breakout. Second day, just kind of inside day. Then we're up. Then we're up. You know, we're up. Okay. But we have an eight day moving average that's rolling over now. Now, if we close where we are right now, uh, we will have what members know as a potential three day trailing stop rule. Because if we close where we are today, that will be a close under the high day low, high day being the 20th. For me, with a rollover of an eight day moving average, that triggers the exit for 50% of my position. So, you know, 50% of my position will be at risk of exiting. If I exit 50%, I'll have no desire to take it back. Is it gone? I, you know, I, I think it's a bad habit to get out of trades, jump back in, get out of trades, jump back in, get out of trades, jump back in. There's plenty of other good charts, you know, chart patterns that'll, that'll take place. You just have to wait. So I don't want to ever become compulsive about an individual market. Um, do you take the continuation pattern or the pattern of the contract month? Always a pattern of the contract month. Uh, it's a really good question because even here in gold, I'll try to show gold here. You know, continue, there's several continuation patterns that that I use. Continuation patterns, which I define numerically as the 055 patterns, are continuation patterns where the December will stop being plotted and it'll roll to the February contract on the first notice date in 055. The 057 continuation chart rule is probably already rolled from the December to the February contract because February becomes most active. And then, of course, the 056, it is rolled on the continuation pattern when the contract expires. And so, but nevertheless, you know, no matter what the continuation chart shows in futures, I have to trade an actual contract month. And so I always need to find some reason uh, uh, and preferably a, a parallel or mirrored chart pattern on the nearby contract that I trade in order to do that. And so uh, and that's how I base the entry is how I base the, the, the protective stops. And so continuation patterns are good because they, you know, they give me a, a broader overview, but they might not necessarily, they sometimes might be a little deceptive, particularly continuation charts in uh, perishable uh, mar livestock, for instance, can be very deceiving. Continuation charts in the softs can be deceiving. They can be deceiving in markets that have full carrying, that are in a carrying charge structure, such as natural gas, which, you know, from month to month, they can change quite a bit. Uh, and, and so you always have to know that you've got an actual tradable daily chart that can trade. Okay, Jolene, is that it for questions? That was the last question. Thank you very much, Peter. All right. Well, we're coming in just short of an hour. So, hey, those that joined us as guests, thank you for joining us. We appreciate having you. Hopefully, um, it gives you a flavor of how I look at market, how I position markets, uh, and so forth. Um, but nevertheless, appreciate you spending a little bit of time this morning with us. So that's it, Jolene. I'll let you close us up.
And as Peter said, I'd like to echo his. Thank you so much for joining us today, Factor members and guests from Twitter. It was so nice to have you. We do have a private Twitter page. Our members have direct access to Peter, and he is on there throughout the day and answering questions. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day, everyone.